Great, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, my name is Alyssa Young. I work as the director for Be Original Americas, and we're so excited to have you joining us today for our very first ever worldwide virtual student fellowship. When we launched our fellowship five years ago, it was to give two students an in-person behind the scenes look at the entire design industry through visits to our various member companies. Sadly, that wasn't able to happen this year, given everything that's going on in the world. But we're so proud to be able to bring this virtually to you to include many more students on our journey. We'll be visiting firms that believe in and stand for authenticity in design and architecture. Thank you for joining us. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm very excited to introduce a true dynamic duo. We have joining us today, Greg Buckbinder, CEO of Emico, who was born and raised in Southern California. His love of surfing in the ocean gave him a strong appreciation and connection to the environment. His parents loved to design and his father loved making furniture. With this background, it's no wonder that it was his destiny to own Emico. Greg remains focused on making chairs in America using sustainability sourced reclaimed materials, repurposed materials, and making products that are made to last. Joining him today is Jay Buckbinder, Greg's daughter, and she is certainly following in her father's footsteps. Jay works in production development in MFO, and her focus on environmental material innovation, manufacturing processes, and development of new designs. She studied sustainable design and engineering at Stanford University and went on to get her master's degree in management science and engineering. In her own words, after a lifetime of brainwashing from Greg, she loves chairs, running, and the ocean. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Greg and Jay Buckbinder. Thank you, uh, Alyssa. And, and I want to thank be original. Um, you guys have done an outstanding job to keep this fellowship going under really um, difficult circumstances. And, you know, it, this is actually the silver lining to be able to talk to so many different students is, is a real benefit. So with that, um, Jay and I will walk you through the purpose at Emico, what we do, how we do it, and try to give you a hands-on look as though you were at the factory. Yeah, and just to reintroduce ourselves too, um, I'm Jay, I'm Greg's daughter. I'm a little bit taller than him, so you might not <laughs> know, um, but I work in product development at Emico. So I work a lot with uh, materials, manufacturing, and the designers. So hopefully you guys in the future will be designing chairs for Emico and we'll get to work together. So we're, Jay and I right now are in Long Beach, California. The Emico factory is in Hanover, Pennsylvania. So at the end, if, uh, you know, we always love, because we do talks at different schools, um, the questions are really always great. And uh, please, we wanna make this relevant for you. And so anything you wanna know, um, please send in your questions along the way. Yeah, great. Let's start off. Um, by talking about how Emico started. Yeah, so back in 1944, World War II, the Navy had a problem. The problem was furniture for ships. Furniture for ships, in particular chairs, they need to be lightweight because a ship is, the more weight you put up high, the more it rolls. So you need something light. Out at the sea, you need something non-corrosive. You need something, obviously, on a ship that's fireproof. You need something that doesn't affect the instruments, that's non-magnetic. And probably most important of all, you need something super strong so the big burly sailors wouldn't destroy it because they're out for months at a time. And Emico's solution was so brilliant, it became standard issue for all warships. Yeah, and I think that's a really good place for us to start and show you actually a little insight into the factory since you won't be going on a tour, a film that was made that will kind of show you more about the process that's going on. That's the way Emico chairs started that's still going on today. Is there anything you want to say before we start? No, let's go. Okay. Roll it.
We make chairs in America out of recycled aluminum. It's lightweight, non-corrosive, fireproof, and super strong. 77 steps is what it takes to make an Emico chair. This process is a totally impractical process for a chair, unless you want a chair to last 150 years. We do everything under one roof. We cut the material, we form it, we weld it, we grind it, we anneal it, we heat treat it, we hand brush it, we anodize it. And in each of these steps, there's all these small details. It was a combination of science and the art of craftsmanship and where they intersect. In Hanover, Pennsylvania, there's not that many manufacturing jobs left. And Emico is one of those few companies where people can do craft jobs, people can do things with their hands. There's generations where there's a father and his son and even his grandson that have worked at Emico. One of the things I think is really significant that we're doing in the factory is polishing. It takes us eight hours per chair. And after eight hours of polishing, that chair looks like a piece of jewelry. So that's, that's kind of gives you a little insight into how the factory is. And it's actually really interesting because I haven't been to the factory since March. I don't know when the last time you went, but um, I really miss it. And seeing the guys on film, you know, like the guys that help us with all the prototyping, like Josh and Joaquin and Jesse, um, it's, it's kind of fun to see them on film again. You know, one thing that, that um, the, the two fellows that were selected we do miss out on not being in the factory. What we've done in other fellowships is they go to the factory in work clothes, and then we have them actually make their own 106 Navy chair, the picture of the chair there, step by step by step. And when they're finished, they get to take it home with them. So I'm sorry we we're not able to do it this time, but maybe next year. Yeah. Um, or of course, any of the fellows are, that you wanna, students wanna come visit us sometime. We'd love to show you around. So why is this chair so important? Why, you know, what became, why is the 1006 the Emico chair? You know, it, it, it's, it's the chair internally because it's our bar. It's something made from 80% recycled material, tested to last 150 years. It's the ultimate in sustainability. A long life product is what we're always shooting for. So whenever we're making anything, we always look to this chair as would it, would it meet the standards that we set for this chair? 
Yeah. The other thing that's interesting is it was made out of recycled material before anything was cool to be made out of recycled material because it's 80% recycled aluminum back in 1945, you know, and then now to this day, people are starting to catch on about being sustainable and environmental and using recycled materials, but it's something that we've always started with, which is- Yeah, and, and actually at the time, during World War II, there were shortages and there were scrap drives for things like glass and paper and aluminum, and Americans felt patriotic to contribute to the war effort. Yeah. And it was just something we did. And in fact, today, when you go through the factory, any kind of scrap, anything that's, that's uh, an offshoot of the production gets recycled. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting about the 1006 is it's very recognizable. And a lot of you guys may know it because it's in so many different movies and films like Avatar, even Incredibles, there's an animated one. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because originally the chair was used in, in Navy hospitals, Navy prisons. It was a chair that was in prisons and you see it all the time. It's a bad guy chair, it's in interrogation rooms, it's in, it's in the prison cell, and that's, that's where it's probably seen mostly in the movies. Yeah, so going from the Navy chair out to the Emico product line now, um, one of the huge things that turned the trajectory of Emico was the collaborations. And I was wondering, you know, when you first were working at Emico, what did you envision or did you envision where it is now? Yeah, well, when I first was at Emico, they had basically one chair and one customer. And that's not a very good way to have a healthy business. And in fact, the business wasn't healthy. The roof leaked, uh, we had a skeleton crew, and the guys were just kind of waiting for the day that the, the factory would close. But what I saw when I went there was these good bones, this incredible product made with the most robust engineering, beautiful, simple design, and from an environmental standpoint, which I care so much about, it was everything that I ever want to do from a, a product standpoint. Yeah. So then I think this is a perfect segue into the first major collaboration. Um, tell me about how you ended up working with Philippe Stark. So we needed to generate sales. And I took a 1006 chair to New York City and I went on the subway with this chair and uh, went from shop to shop down in, in, in Soho and into vintage stores and into retail stores and trying to find a way to, you know, get sales going. And I stopped by a trade show and I went at that time, it was called ICFF. And I was walking up and down the aisles and I ran into Philippe Stark. And I said, Mr. Stark, I said, you know, I'm staying at the Paramount Hotel. And I just love what you did with the Emoker chair. And he took a Navy chair and put a, a slip cover over the back. And he said, oh, he said, uh, what company are you with? And I said, I'm with Emico. We make the Navy chair. He said, oh, I thought it would be a bunch of old military guys. <laughs> so he said, I've always dreamed of designing a chair for Emico. Would you be interested? I said, well, we'd be interested, but we can't afford you. He said, no, no. He said, let's sit down and, and we'll work it out. And that was over 20 years ago. And he, we met at a hotel, the Royalton Hotel that he had designed. And he did all these sketches on the back of a magazine and all of the sketches we ultimately we built. And, you know, again, working with a guy like Stark, you can just tell by this photograph, we had a great time. Anytime we met, he is fun. So as from a standpoint of students, one of the things I'd like to always recommend, no matter what you're working on, really enjoy it and enjoy the process. And you could do top level design and still have a good time. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to contrast the way Stark works, which is very fun and eccentric with the output, which is the, one of the most elegant chairs, you know. Right, and, and very precise. If you really look at this chair and you look at a 1006 Navy chair, you'll see it's the same legs, it's the same seat bottom, it's the same material. He polished it and he said, I wanted to make it more neutral. So what, what Stark did for us is he took a company that was an industrial producer and he made us sexy 
And all of a sudden we went and we became a design furniture company because of his design vision and what he did. So here's a chair. We made 1,000 of them 20 years ago for the Hudson Hotel, a very high use hotel. And these chairs get a lot of use. And today, 20 years later, there's 1,000 of these same chairs still in use. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Um, and this is, this is just a photo of them in use. Um, I think it, it really has always been stunning to me how much the polishing just really makes the chairs look super high end. And it's so funny because the polishing room in the factory is like this dark room in the back and it's very industrial. So to have the output be this beautiful thing is really interesting. Yeah, we didn't polish initially. Uh, we didn't know how to polish. We didn't even know. We, Stark wanted to make something and he wanted a very bright, shiny finish. And we thought, can we, do, can we powder coat it? Can we chrome it? Can we? And all of the solutions weren't environmentally good and weren't long lasting. And finally, we went over to our neighbors in, um, at Harley Davidson and they showed us how to polish. And the result was we just took our standard aluminum put it on a polishing lathe with compound and who would have known, but this is the result. And, you know, again, as designers, it's always great to bring companies insight into things they don't know about. It really changes their business forever. And I think that actually goes both ways because what Stark did for Emico was really open it up to show other designers and architects, this is a company you can collaborate with. This is a design company. Right. Which ties into the next one. Yeah, well, people knew the Navy chair, but they didn't really know Emico until we started working with Stark. The other thing that Stark does is he designs ships and hotels and restaurants and offices, and, and he puts our furniture in them. And you can see by this photograph, it always looks beautiful. And it's always nice to be included in installations that because they get photographed and they go in magazines and it just helps to, for a company like ours, it helps us to sell our product and ultimately make, make your designs profitable because most designers we work, in fact, all designers we work with are paid on a royalty. So the more that we sell, the better for the designer. Um, my first project at Emico about 12 years ago. Right, so this is with Frank Gehry. And we did two projects with Frank Gehry. This is this first one that we're showing you is called Tuyo Mayo. And it's a lounge chair and it was a one-off project done for raising money for Heredity Disease Foundation. And this is uh, Jay and Frank discussing the project. And um, it was a lot of fun. We used to come in on Saturdays and we'd sit in Frank's office and we made models and it was, a, it was a great time and a great experience. And yeah, it really was. And I think it's interesting though, because Frank worked very differently than Philippe Stark, right? Yeah, they're totally different. So Stark is like, show them yeah, Stark basically knew exactly what he wanted to achieve. It was like climbing a mountain with Stark, he'd say, Here's the things you need in your backpack. Here's how many days it's going to take. Here's how much food you need. Very precise and very, very focused. Frank Gehry, on the other hand, said, I don't know where we're going to go. Pack your stuff. We're going to hop in a rocket. And where we <laughs> land, I'll, I'll know when we're there. So it, it's just a very different way they work. And you can obviously see by Frank Gehry's buildings and what he wanted to do. Uh, was oh he always wants to do things that are very unique. So then how did you end up with Superlight? Maybe this is a better picture. Well, to start off with, he did the, the sketch on the left. And the sketch on the left, uh, when you work with Frank Gehry for a while, as some of his associates have, they were able to explain to me that this meant movement. So just like a building moves, it's in aluminum, or an airplane moves the wings because of aluminum, he wanted the chair to flex, so when you sat down in it, it was comfortable. Um, so it was a very loose concept. He, he, the idea was movement and comfort. Yeah. The interesting thing here is you see how the designers that we work with are 
bringing in their own practice. You know, Frank Gehry as a major architect designed a chair like a building. Um, then when you look at people like the next collaboration, they design chairs as like small scale products. Right. So um, talk about the most recent chair, the Barbara Osgerby on and on. You know, so um, on and on, uh, the, the designers of this were um, Ed Barber, Jay Oscarby, and they're in London. And the, the project started with material. We had been working with recycled PET for about 13 years. And as we worked on this material to improve it, improve it, improve it, we finally have gotten to a point where we were able to take the material, make a chair, grind it up, and make a chair from a chair. Complete closed loop recycling. That was the basic brief. Um, then it went to um, Ed and Jay, and they did some sketches and some ideas and some concept. And, and really their brilliance on this, this project was, um, I think if we go to the next slide, um, if you look at how these chairs are stacked, they did everything in a, in a real circular way. So the seat bottom was circular, the stacking was circular, the name on and on was circular. And of course the material was circular in order for the, the chair could live on and on forever. Yeah, the um, most fun part about working on this chair was also changing some, and something we'll go into more is changing the perception of plastic in um, making it super durable. So uh, at Emico, we have pretty rigorous strength standards, which includes the throw it against the wall test. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it's interesting because it's really, we always want a chair to far exceed standards. So we're testing in the computer initially doing FEAs and wherever any weak points are, we go back to the designer and say, we want to beef it up here, beef it up there. The goal is certainly we want it to look beautiful. Certainly we want it to function, but we really want to give it a long life. So here's, here's the, the test Ready? after production. Yep. Right is the same chair getting thrown against the wall, and you just would have no idea that a type of plastic that looks that thin and dainty would end up being super strong, but it is really important to us. And I think that ties into our next section of things that have really defined Emico, which is um, material. So um, I think one thing we've always talked about before Emico even is being conscious of waste and what happens to the waste after you get rid of it. You know, where, where's everything that you're getting rid of from your home, whether it's recycling or trash, where is that going? Yeah, you know, I don't know about you guys. I always wonder, every Tuesday I take out our, our recycled bin and I do my wish cycling. I wish that all of the things I put in that that recycle bin get recycled. But I do know, very doubtful that everything does get recycled. And part of it is the ability, my ability to be knowledgeable enough to put things in there that will ultimately be able to be recycled. So one thing as a manufacturer, you know, we, we start with, with that as our, our input, the waste material. And then we make products that can be recycled after a long, long life. Recycling is kind of at the very last thing you have to do, not something at the beginning. You know, that after decades, it's recycled. Yeah. That's a goal. So talk about this project because this was pretty major for Emico in terms of waste material. Yeah, back in uh, 2006, we were approached by Coca-Cola and, and the problem they had was the waste plastic bottles ending up in the landfill. I mean, in 50 years, they knew there'd be trillions of these bottles. And the challenge was, how do we take this waste plastic, upcycle it, make it in something strong and durable? 
and we worked on this project for four years and we the result was the 111 share and we were able so far we've kept over 40 million bottles out of the landfill and probably even more importantly we share what we do we share our materials with other manufacturers who also are now using the recycled pet material and i think one major thing is that it offered a proof of concept that you can use this ugly unconsolidated waste material and make something beautiful and durable that lasts a long time that you you're not you're not compromising on your values in order to use that waste material right right of course it's a lot harder if you, <laughs> if you use virgin material it's cheaper it's easier but you're going to have a lot more impact on the planet, negative yeah. impact. I think also, um, the re using this recycled plastic started to show us that even though plastic has a bad perception, that you can use plastic responsibly and create durable products to keep plastic out of landfills and oceans. Yeah, so an another example is Alfie. Yeah, Alfie, uh, the material is the same material that we did previously for a product that we designed with uh, that Stark designed called the broom chair, which is a great chair and it's uh, wood and polypropylene. So uh, Jasper really liked the material and he liked the feel of it and how it, how it worked. And so the shell of this chair is made with that same material and the legs are, this is uh, sustainably sourced ash wood from, um, our neighbors in Lancaster, it's uh, an Amish uh, uh, family. And how this works is uh, Jasper did this design and then we mock it up and then we test it. And then we go back to Jasper and say, okay, we need to beef it up some more and here's where it's weakest. So again, um, wood is a little harder to do computer analysis FEAs because it always behaves differently with different woods. So we, we physically test it and test it and test it until we really get something that's super strong. Yeah, and just to clarify, it's Jasper Morrison in case we uh, didn't say his full name before. And he's been pretty crucial for Emco. Yeah. And Philippe Stark in case we didn't say Philippe. <laughs> <laughs> um, working on Alfie though is an example of a really cool Emco project because you're doing the testing on this recycled wood polypropylene on one hand and then flipping back to the Amish facility and doing wood testing and it's um, everything has the same goal in mind but um, it it's a lot of different different ideas and methodologies that go into it um, this this picture I put in here because this is actually my favorite coffee shop up in Santa Cruz, California. And this is an Alfie with a low back. Um, and I used to surf in the morning and then come do my homework here during the day before they actually had any Alfies, but Alfie's still the chair I work on at home. And just showing that this plastic recycled material can be elegant and beautiful. Um, it's a pretty cool idea. Yeah. It, it it really feels good after you've worked years on a project and it ends up in some place that you have a lot of respect for and you know you feel very proud yeah proud parents <laughs> um this sue is an interesting project because emico didn't just stay with one material so how did how did you guys end up doing four so the the main guy in charge at Nendo for design is O.K. Sato. And O.K. Sato uh, visited us and he said, um, I said, you know, what, what would you like to do? And he said, well, first I'd like to see all the things you're working on, all the materials, because we're always doing R&D on all kinds of different materials just to see how they function for product. And we showed him around and after we walked through the whole factory I said okay okay what would you like to to use and he said why not all of them <laughs> so we we did uh, go back to that other slide the first one and we can you know there you can see at the bottom of the screen there's uh, wood the wood is from 
old barns in, in Pennsylvania, like 200, 300 year old barns that the wood is taken down and then milled and made into this shape. And in the center is, uh, is the cork seat. And in the, on the left of that is a concrete seat made with eco-concrete, 50% recycled glass. And then up top is a, a plastic seat made from plastic milk cartons that's, that's uh, recycled HDPE. Yeah, HDPE. Mm -hmm. And this one, this picture is interesting because this is actually different testing for the eco concrete. So, you know, when we do in a material, it's not as simple as grinding it up and molding it. We're testing strength properties, aesthetic properties, you know, like what's showing on the surface? How do we get it the right sheen? Because if concrete gets too shiny, all of a sudden it looks like plastic. And then is it even worthwhile to have it be concrete? Um, which brings up another point, which is, you know, why make an why make an eco concrete chair? Why test yeah. these things? Well, you know what I mean. It, it, it was it was interesting to test the material, and I thought, well, it's always a good thing because other industries can take what we've learned and use them on, on whatever they're making from from concrete. But what actually happened that that was really surprising is how people use the chair. So, I mean, this concrete chair is super heavy, and I thought, well, nobody wants a heavy little stool, except if you have a bad wind problem and outdoor seating. So the concrete, it could be, it's perfect in the pouring rain, driving wind, it it's, performs well. Someone else used it inside their shower, a place for their <laughs> wife to sit to shave her legs. Again, heavy so it wouldn't move around and completely waterproof. So sometimes you do these projects and you get informed by how they're used that you didn't even expect. Yeah. Definitely. For the final tenant of Emico, um, I wanted to talk about sustainability and how you ended up caring, caring so much about sustainability. You know, first of all, what does sustainability mean to you? Yeah, I mean, sustainability to me is taking something from the waste stream and making it so it never has to go back in. I mean, the 1006 Navy chair is the ultimate. If every industry could look at that chair, if everything you guys designed and you looked at that chair and you tried to make a product that would have that kind of lifespan and made from waste, that's the ultimate. That's the kind of thinking we need. Uh, so from a sustainable standpoint, I think that it's it's really everything. It's energy use, it's 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 everything we do. And as manufacturers, we know that we're using energy to so to make sure we're making something that's you know that's worthwhile of that energy. Right. right. So um, why do you care? Well, I care for a lot of reasons, but I spend a lot of time in the ocean, like like this morning. Uh, we we go surfing every Friday morning and there's always sea life. There's dolphins and these big giant dolphins were out there. <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe there were whales. <laughs> and there's seabirds and an occasional stingray. Oh. Yeah, Jay got stung uh, a week ago. You know, it, that's another thing that's sort of interesting because it does connect up to what we're doing because the environment is changing, the climate is changing. Yeah. The amount of stingrays has completely gone crazy because of the warmer waters and you know it's it's affecting things i my whole life i had never been stung by a stingray until last year and now it's just gone crazy the amount of people getting stingray stings so the environment needs to be taken care of yeah i do think it's exactly what you're saying of the more time you spend in the environment the more you care about it you know you want to protect the things that you love right um which ties into the idea of how important durability is for emico you know, what, is, what does this mean for you? Yeah, I mean, for a manufacturer, for any manufacturer, the, the best you can do um, is to make something the highest quality possible, the longest life possible. That's gonna have the least impact. That durability is the key. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there used to be a time when people design products and there was planned obsolescence so that they could sell more 
Yeah, it still is. Yeah. And I think uh, as designers, you should strive for the longest possible life, the most durable product possible. And on the left here, we were actually testing our one inch reclaim. It was, I think it was like 28 degrees outside and we were trying to see how the glides test up to extreme temperatures. So, you know, making sure that everything we make is gonna hold up and even the smallest component of it will stay, I think is very important. But, you know, there's another kind of durability, um, which I think is more of an emotional durability. Sure, I mean, you, if people love something that they have, they take good care of it and they keep it. So emotionally, when you design, you want to design products that people will really enjoy, appreciate, take care of, and keep. Yeah, this is actually on the right. This is my one of my good friend's dogs, Aki, and she um, goes on Craigslist and finds Emico chairs and goes and buys them. And these are chairs that have been made probably in the 50s and just cleans them up and loves them. And that's pretty incredible for a product to still have that kind of emotional currency so much later. Okay, so here's the tough question. You know, you care about the environment, you care about design, but there's so many things you could be doing. Why, Emiko? Well, some things just feel right. Uh, Emiko has always felt right to me. Um, it's, it's something that I want to do. It's, it also helps me, it helps to be my voice. Um, and I think, I think a product like this 1006 chair is more than a chair. It's a symbol and it's a symbol for future generations that here's something, you know, it's those chairs in Hudson hotel that can last and, and, and they'll probably outlast the hotel and they'll end up at restaurants when the hotel closes down. So to me, it's, it's, it's really playing my part and doing the best I can because there's future generations. And you know, it's interesting working with my daughter because I kind of feel like my generation has trashed the planet and we need to do everything we can to set future generations up, your generations, to be able to, you know, you're gonna to have to help fix it. And so it's part of my payback. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Okay. So um, I guess kind of summing up a few things that, you know, are, are part of the, the talk. I, I, I came up with a few things that I think as designers, you should always do on a project. Yeah. And I think one, solve big problems like Emiko did for the Navy or Emiko did for Coca-Cola. Um, use waste whenever you can for your input. Um, design things that are useful and needed. Um, and always design things that last. And, and finally, uh, have fun, enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, I think that definitely preempts my question of offering advice to young designers. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a good answer. Okay, so we're ready to take any questions you have, so please feel free. Great, thank you, Greg and Jig. This has been such an informative presentation. I think we can go ahead and stop the screen share. Students, we're gonna move over to Q&A. Just a reminder that you can find that function either at the bottom or top of your screen, just depending on the device that you're using. Greg, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? What were you doing before Emico? How you ended up at Emico? Okay, um, my background is I, I, uh, I surfed. I surfed a lot. <laughs> I surfed before school, after school, sometimes during school. Uh, my mom was, uh, did interiors and painted, was very creative. And my dad was an engineer and always had projects, always building things. So I, I grew up in, a, in an environment where there's always projects going on. He did uh, work for Herman Miller and made worked on some of the Eames chairs. So when they would go to trade shows, they'd give him these rejects that would end up in our house. And so it was, a, it was a great place where I would be able to see 
you know, really, really great engineering design. And then, um, you know, my love for the environment was, was through surfing. And went on to uh, college, USC, and took business classes, but also always took design classes. So I, I kind of was left brain and right brain. And my dad acquired Emico back in the 70s. And he had kept it going for several decades. And in the 90s, uh, the company was really losing a lot of money and not doing very well. And I bought it for my dad in 1998. For a dollar. For a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Although it had a lot of debt to pay back. Well, it's a great backstory. As family members, what is it like working together? Would you recommend it? If, if you are close with your family, we were actually just talking about this before. It's amazing. It's my favorite thing. I mean, I'll leave family dinner on Sunday night and just be like, see you tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really fun for us to get to spend a lot of time together. And we are also, he, he knows where my values are because he gave me those values. So I think we're very aligned. Definitely, you can push each other's buttons more than anyone else can, but I would say we actually push each other's buttons less than I thought before starting. Yeah, no, it's, it's fun. It's really, it's fun to work together. And, you know, again, Jay has been designing chairs uh, ever since <laughs> I started with Leap Stark, and she would have me show him some of her little paper cutouts. So, you know, it, it's sort of inevitable that we're working together now. It's great that you have the relationship. For the polished aluminum, we have a question if over time it needs to be repolished. You know, it's interesting because Palo Antonelli at the Museum of Modern Art always said, the beauty of this chair will be after years and years and years, after it tarnishes some and the, the butt dip becomes shinier and has some scratches in it. Um, I have the first 10 chairs at home and I live down at the beach and they, they do slowly tarnish, but they're 20 oh, years really? old now, yeah. but not yeah. really. So they haven't really tarnished much. And they are a little duller. If I want to, and I want to make them just look like absolute brand new, um, I can take rubbing compound, polish them out, put wax on them, make them look exactly brand new, or you know, a car detailer would do that kind of thing. I like them because they're aging with me a little bit. and. They're also kind of cool because all our family dinners have been on these same chairs. And you know, long after I'm done, our stories and our time together will be passed on to you know, my kids. Right, it gives it a little bit of history. Yeah. What would your advice be for new designers who are just starting out and might not initially be able to afford everything that goes into manufacturing their own furniture? Yeah, and manufacturing is is very expensive, and I I think that for just starting out, um, my recommendation is work for one of the top talented designers. Learn what they do and how they do it. Um, you'll there's so much to learn along the way, and you know a lot of times I'll have a student ask me, you know, why don't you ever have you know, a young designer like one of us do designs. And maybe if you're a company that's making something that is, you know, like out of upholstery or something that doesn't require much tooling, but a project of ours, it typically takes about a million dollar investment to do. We've got to get it right. I want someone that has failed for decades and really knows how to do things really well. So the experience is so important. And to work with someone that's got that experience that has, you know, seeing what works and what doesn't work, uh, I'd recommend that as a good starting point. I also think the one thing I wish I had done more, and I'm, I'm not on the design side necessarily, I'm more on the engineering side, is um, learn more about suppliers. You know, like go to different factories. And people, I think, usually are pretty good about letting you in and letting you tour around. So trying to find places near you where you can see how things are made and get a sense of physicality. So when you go to design something, you know 
you know, like this is how a tube bender works. This is how things are welded. So you know what your constraints are. Absolutely, that's great advice. How do you approach the manufacturing process of new forms, new materials, or scales? You know, it, it's interesting because um, a lot of it comes from your own intuition from years and years of doing it. Um, and some, sometimes, especially when we're, we're working with new materials, we're going down a dark alley and we don't know what will happen. So a lot of it is from the engineers and Jay and doing R&D to tell us how this material is going to perform and what's going to happen to us. So, um, you know, but if we're doing a chair that's like out of aluminum, we know aluminum really well. We've been doing it for 76 years. We, we kind of know what will work, what doesn't work. We pretty much, you know, for everything you see us that looks beautiful, we've done 10 times that in mistakes. Yeah. It's, it's fun when you start off with a new material and someone sends you like a sample of something completely crazy and you, we sit down and we kind of talk about it. We're like, okay, which way do we want to go with this? You test something out, you kind of hit a dead end, you turn around, you test something else out. And any given moment, there's probably like six materials that we're testing and one will come up and be useful. So, uh, you know, a lot of it's throwing spaghetti at the wall, you know, like testing anything and just seeing what shakes out. Right, and that exploration is so important. Right now, what would you say is your favorite material you enjoy working with? That's a good question. Yeah, you, you know, I, I don't know that I have a favorite. I, I, I really like, the journey we've been on with the recycled PET because one, I can see the positive impact we're having by keeping bottles out of landfills and out of the ocean. And that's, I think, making a difference and in, in inspiring people. And we, you know, I, I think a lot of people will, will work on something and then work on something completely different. We've stayed, our, our work on this, the, the recycled PET, has continued to, to try to make it better. And we had to because we had problems molding the 111 chair. So we needed to make it better. We needed to have less flaws. We needed to make something that was that was we can grind up and recycle. So it kind of forced us to make it better. But in that process over 13 years, we made a much better material. So I'm I'm difficult journey but it was a very um we, we did a good job on that yeah i would say mine goes back and forth but for the milan that just didn't happen we had been working on a few products that were kind of back to the roots aluminum and it was so fun because we were at the factory and like working with the welders and we could you know, start with sheet in the morning and have a prototype by the afternoon. And that, you can't really do that with plastic because you need this big tooling. And so to be able to have something that's super sturdy over the course of eight hours is pretty, that's, aluminum's a pretty incredible material. And our guys are so talented. They're so good. And to be able to actually sit and say, what do you think will happen if we do this and this? They'll, they'll know without it, just looking at it, touching yeah. it. And then they'll say, let me show you what I can do. Yeah. And so you, you really make huge progress with, because they just know the material so well. At one, at one point, we had two guys holding a sheet while the other guy was holding the brushing thing. And they had it on a dolly and were spinning it around because we were trying to see if we could get the brushing to go in a circle. And there's two big guys just spinning the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> it's very fun. Yeah. That must have been quite a sight. Yeah. I know you guys have a partnership with Coca-Cola. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, it was a joint venture. So, you know, when they approached me initially, I wasn't interested because I didn't want to do something that was just a, a marketing project. You know, we're, we're really making serious product and we didn't want to make something that was a promotional product. And to that point, it was like, we don't want Coca-Cola 
name shown on this. We want serious architects and designers to be able to use it in their projects that, that they want. So the, the Coca-Cola relationship, uh, they, they said, no, we really want to make a difference. We really want to keep this material out of landfills and we really want to get a lot of different companies to start using this material for their products. So their, their intentions were really in parallel with ours. And once we, we got going on it, they were great because they pretty much left us alone and let us <laughs> do what we need to do. But when we went to try to solve some problems, all of a sudden this little company, Emico, because we were working with Coca-Cola, we had access to some of the top material scientists in the world. So we, we really were fortunate to have a partner like that, that, that gave people the, the feeling that this could be significant. So it allowed us to really work with super smart people and, and really do good work. Right, yeah, it definitely sounds like a very impactful partnership. One of the students let us know that he recently bought a one reclaimed chair and loves it, surprised by the light weight of it. Can you talk about the design process that went into that? The one inch reclaimed, yeah. is that it? Okay, the one inch reclaimed was designed by Jasper Morrison. And initially we had done the one inch series with an aluminum frame and a plastic seat and a plastic seat bottom. And it, it's, you know, when you work with aluminum, because there's so much hand work, it's, it gets very expensive and you end up with a chair. That's, it's a terrific chair, but from a price point, it's hard to do much volume because you know, people can't afford to use them. And then um, someone came up with the idea, why don't we do this because it's such a great chair completely in the recycled plastic material, the WPP material. And so we, we went ahead and did that. So the process started, it probably took us four years to get to where we ended up. Yeah, the thing that gets hard with monoblock plastic chairs is you see all kinds of different conditions where the plastic's flowing through the tool. So you get some parts where it's thick, some parts where it's thin and trying to make it really consistent and high quality, it's pretty tough. Yeah. But it's a great chair. It's, yeah, it's nice. indoor, outdoor, comfortable, stacks. It's, it's just a very, it, it can work anywhere and it will never go out of style. It just, yeah. it's, it's, it's a really well done chair. You work with so many great designers. Who would you really like to work with in the future? Hmm. You know, that's interesting because um, for us, material is really the, the driving force. And I think I would like to, to work on a project where there's like a material scientist that is really passionate that, that we can work on a material and come up with a solution that it hasn't been done before. Um, so I don't have a name of a, of a designer. I mean, we're kind of fortunate because we, we have a long line of people that have asked to work with us, but we really keep it small because we want to keep our quality as high as we can. So we do only a few projects at a time. So it's, I don't know, I, I'm not sure. Do you have an? I have an answer. Yeah. yeah. Our, our product development team, it's uh, myself and another woman, Nicole Rundi, and we call ourselves Femico because we're the fem of Femico. And it's very unusual for a product development team actually to be all female, especially in Emico's pretty heavy manufacturing. Um, it would be very cool to also work with a female designer that fits the Emico motif. I think that'd be awesome. Well, I did work with Andre Putman on a, mm -hmm. on a project. While I'm at Emico. <laughs> <laughs> so you're on the spot now. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and actually in today's world, there are so many really talented women designers that we see their, their work. And so, yes, we're, we actually have had discussions with, with a couple different women and yeah. it, it won't be that much longer that we, we have someone. Yeah. That's great. 
When deciding between recycling material, using recycled materials and raw materials, how do you determine which to go with, especially when thinking about the longevity of a product? I think there is a perception that virgin material will be more durable than recycled material um, across the board. And it's actually, I feel like we've proven that to not be true. It's more of the process you use. So um, we always know that the waste material is going to be more upfront R&D investment. But um, once you figure it out, you actually have a jump on the rest of the industry because you've used this new material. You've had, you have a whole different process set up. Um, I think it is very, very rare. I don't know if it's ever happened that we've said we should not use waste material. We should go with the virgin version. I feel like we've always gone with the waste. We version. never do. Yeah. I mean, that's just part of our, our, our value system. It's, it, that's why we make chairs. We're not, we're not interested in using virgin material and, and, you know, plastic is this remarkable material and you could make so many things and it, it's, it's incredible, but it never goes away. Yeah. And the only way it goes away is if you burn it and that's not so good either. Yeah. So, for us, it's like there's so much, so many things made of plastic. We just want to help use it in a smarter way. But I think the only compromise you have to make when you use recycled material is that original investment in R&D. After that, you can, with most materials, you can get the same material properties, if not better. I would, I would say that's true. However, there has been, especially... Uh, the old days, a lot of crappy material made with recycled yeah, material. Yeah. And you see a lot of people who are repurposing things, but it, it's not really, they, they don't invest yeah. in the R&D or the tooling. Yeah. With the right investment, you can get, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> that makes sense. Unfortunately, I think that's all the time that we have for today, but I do have one last question. Are there any final words of wisdom that you'd like to leave the students who are listening today? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants my words of wisdom. Well, you know, I, I think the one thing that I have learned over all my years of doing this is everything I work on comes back and helps me at some point. I might not know it at the time. So whatever you're working on, never get discouraged. Learn as much as you can, because at some point, you'll be able to use that knowledge and it will help you on some other project further down the road. Yeah, and something you've always told me is do what you love. You know, yeah. Make sure you're doing something that is really meaningful to you, that brings you purpose. Um, it just makes work so much easier, it makes work life in a really good way. Absolutely. That's great advice. Well, Greg, Jay, I want to say a huge thank you for taking the time to come on today and for such an incredibly impactful and inspiring presentation. Students, I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in today. If you want to learn more about Emico, you can visit emico.net or their Instagram at Emico Chairs. If you'd like to learn more about Be Original Americas, you can visit our website, beoriginalamericas.com, or our Instagram at beoriginalusa. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye.